Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming down on time. Um, so today I'll be teaching you guys a workshop on Chrome DevTools. So before I start, may I just get like a show of hands? How many um here are like experienced web developers already? Oh, so okay, most people here are completely beginner to programming as well. Okay, so um. Well, the good thing is, uh, when I was planning for this workshop, it's meant to be tailored towards like very beginner, um, experience as well. So, um, you should be able to follow along with very minimal programming experience. But if at any point in time you get lost, do just raise up your hand, and I can just guide you through it. So, first thing about Chrome Dev Tools, I think. Um, the reason why I chose to conduct this workshop is because I feel that it's a very underrated and underutilized tool that most people tend to overlook. Um, many of you probably opened it by accident before, um, whether you know what it does or um, you don't know, well, today we can find out together. So the link to the slides are on the board. And you can just click through there and follow along. I intend for this workshop to be pretty hands-on. So the slides will have um not uh the, the information on the slides are not very comprehensive. Um, but I'll be showing you the demo live and you can follow along as well. Yeah. I'll give you guys some time to scan the QR code or just copy the link. Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is River. I'm a comp team member of NUS Hackers. I'm also a year two CS undergrad. I used to do quite a bit of um, front end development, which is where I mostly use DevTools. But in my free time, I also compete in CTS with NUS Grey Hats. And I also found that um, in Grey Hats, when I was doing like security related stuff, um, doing um, attacks on the client side for web applications. It's really, really useful to be very well versed in Chrome DevTools, especially the debugger. Um, and it really gives you a more comprehensive understanding of what is happening um, on a web, web application, which is also very essential for developers. So some prerequisites, um, software-wise, you only need the browser. Um, if you have Google Chrome, great. That's what I'll be using as well. But if you don't have Google Chrome, as long as you're using like some popular browser, you should be able to do most of what I'm about. Uh, I'm going to show you in this workshop. Um, I haven't tested on Safari, but I'm pretty sure Firefox has a very similar uh, set of features. Um, and while it's not required, some uh, knowledge in HTML, CSS, or JavaScript will be very helpful. Um, in this workshop in getting a better understanding of what is happening. But once again, if at any point in time you don't understand, just uh, let me know and I can explain what is happening in further detail. So this workshop will reference a lot of uh, things from the official uh, Chrome DevTools documentation. You can click the link and it will open up the official documentation where you can see a much more comprehensive and uh, a much more comprehensive documentation of what features um, DevTools actually have. And in your free time, you want to explore further. There are also videos uh, that are made by the people at Google to guide you through as well. So what we'll be covering today, um, first we'll be going through a little bit of what the browser is. And then I'll be going through a very brief overview of what DevTools is. And we'll be focusing on four main functions of DevTools today. Um, the elements panel, the console panel, the sources, um, 
and network panel. So there are much more features that DevTools offers, um, but those features uh, tend to be targeted at more advanced users. So things like website performance optimizations, right? Those um, will only really come in useful when you're already an experienced web developer and you're trying to um, optimize like load times and um, maximize the user experience. Um, but for beginners, these are, won't really come in handy when we are building the application itself, right? So firstly, what is a web browser? So maybe um, anyone wants to just show an answer. What do you guys think a web browser is? Yeah, so yes, that is, um, I guess, more accurate than what I thought a web browser was before I started programming, right? So when I first uh, used a browser, or rather, when most people use a browser, they usually see it as uh, less of an interface with the rest of the internet rather than something to uh just something to search and visit websites right but if you guys are familiar with curl what actually sets a browser apart from making the web request with curl a command line uh, application the difference is it will render it into something visual right but really all the requests that are being made are uh, almost the same. The browser just makes it really user-friendly. It helps you populate all the different parameters and the details so that your web requests um, can be made very easily. So the interaction with all the different servers, the server itself doesn't really know much about what browser you're using, right? The browser is the one that will interact with the server for you and then it will take the content from the server and render it nicely, right? It manages the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to help you, um, to bring you a more interactive, like a uh, graphical interface. And because it is an application that, um, essentially is supposed to make the user experience better compared to just everything command line, right? Um, developers will also need the tools to maximize this interactivity and user experience. So if you guys have ever seen um, documentations on CSS before, you always see that um, the table below to show which browser has a different checkbox. And what that really means is different browsers render and interpret CSS uh, CSS, JavaScript, HTML slightly differently. And for most people that who are developing um, websites, it doesn't really matter because most of the um, commands or code that you'll be writing is supported on most browsers. But we are trying to use uh, uh, the latest like CSS construct then that's where you may find that, oh, not, it won't render the same on every browser, right? So this is something that you could use DevTools to go and see and um, identify what is working and what isn't. So DevTools is something that's built directly in the browser, right? It allows you to edit pages and um, the real key part is it allows you to identify and diagnose problems quickly. Right. It's not meant for you to like code out an entire application, right? You do that in your IDE, but since the browser is what uh, users are seeing, it'll be very useful to not only know what the user is seeing, but know why the user is seeing it, uh, seeing it that way, right? So DevTools basically gives you a more in-depth analysis and view of what the code that you wrote 
is being interpreted as. All right, it allows you to inspect the HTML and CSS to understand how uh, it's being built. And other features include debugging JavaScript to find and fix errors when you're writing um, code for the client. You can also monitor network traffic. And this comes in really useful to see what requests are actually being made by the application that you wrote. Right? Sometimes you make a typo in um, like a URL. And by monitoring the network traffic, you will then be able to identify this when you see an error from that request. And lastly, you can also use it to optimize and improve user experience, but that is something that we will not be going through today. If we have some time, I can show you um, maybe some of the tools that uh, people use to profile web, uh, web pages. Yep. So um, enough like history and talk. Um, we can start with the more hands-on part. So if you guys are on this slide or in any browser right now, you can try out opening DevTools. So you can do it by right-clicking and then you see this menu and you click inspect, right? And you see a window pop up. So in my case, um, mine pops out as a separate window, but you could also use, uh, you see this three button drop down. Not sure are you able to see on the screen, but you can choose the dock side, right? So in my case, I prefer to have it as a separate window, but if you like it attached to the right, the left side or the bottom or the right, that's really like your preference. So yeah, so you can right click inspect um, or more specifically, if you highlight something, say, if you highlight this example domain, you can right click inspect and it brings you directly to the element that you highlighted. All right, I'll go into this more detail in, in more depth, but if you click control shift I or command shift I, it'll bring you to the last panel that you open. So if this was console, then I open it again with the shortcut and you'll bring me to console. And then yeah, control shift C, which I if you can't see me use it, but that was the first thing I used to open the elements tab directly. Um sometimes if you hit F12 on your computer, you might accidentally open this. So now you know like which button you hit last time that would have triggered this. I remember the first time when I opened it. Like I didn't know how to close it. I just reopened my browser. Um, but now you don't have to do that. Yep. So the key panels we're focusing on, the elements. So the purpose of it is to really view and modify HTML and CSS. The console tab um, functions as uh, like a JavaScript um, repo. So it basically, um, you can run commands and it will be executed like constantly, almost like an interpreter. Um, the sources will view, or allow you to see all the different website resources, all the images that it has pulled to render the website, and also all the JavaScript files that is being used um, either for rendering or to provide any functionality. The network, uh, as Carl before, it will track all the requests made by the browser. It also has some features to simulate different um, network speeds. And I'll be going uh, into that later. So firstly, the inspect elements panel, right? It allows you to edit the DOM and see changes in real time. So anyone has heard about the DOM before? Um, so DOM is document uh, object model, and it's slightly different from HTML because it actually refers to um, exactly what you are seeing at that point in time, right? 
HTML is what the developer has written. But let's say uh, you render the page and then uh, you click some button that changes something on the page, right? Now the HTML is slightly different from what the developer originally wrote. And this change is only reflected in the DOM. You refresh the page again, and this change is no longer there, right? So this also means that when you edit things um, using the dev tools, you are editing the DOM. So these changes cannot be saved um, anywhere. So you have to be very clear that, let's say you develop or are developing a website, and then you edit things and then it looks exactly like how you want. Um, there isn't really much of a point because you refresh and all your changes are gone and it's not really safe. So you really have, you have to edit from the source directly to um, ensure that all your, your changes are saved. But that doesn't mean this editing functionality is completely useless. Um, one potential use case could be say uh, you are um, talking to like a designer, right? And then you can really quickly edit the DOM to make it look exactly like how you want it. It's much faster than having to edit the HTML, um, edit the JavaScript, and then compile everything, make it uh, edit the CSS so it looks right, and then send that application so that the web designer can see it. When you can just edit it, edit the DOM, screenshot, and then they can see the image. And another thing you can do is see the CSS rules. So CSS is what uh, determines how the website looks like. And you can do this in a much more graphical way compared to just um, through your IDE. Right? You can modify styles, like uh, experiment with colors, layouts, and everything much faster. And um, personally, I use this uh, tab for fixing layout bugs or identify like what's wrong with the CSS rules that I've written and quickly testing like visual changes, All right? So you can use these links that I've included to try it out. Um, or you can follow along while I demo it. So. The first exercise will be the DOM, right? I get this from Chrome documentation directly. Um, so the first one is to inspect a node, right? And it says to, let me zoom in. Yeah, so if you right, they say right click Michelangelo here, right? So if you right click and inspect, you open DevTools. And here you can see it's, already highlighted for us. You expand it. I zoom this in. Okay. So it's open for us and it says Michelangelo. And if you double click it, you can change it to anything you want. And you'll be reflected here. You, once you close DevTools, it'll still be saved. But the moment you refresh your page, it'll be gone, All right? This, this is back to the original source as specified on the server. So on top of um, just editing elements like this, there's also this button here. So this is really useful for changing your aspect ratio and your screen size. And this is useful when you are developing your website and making it sure that it is compatible for, um, is compatible uh, mobile friendly for like iPads or phones. And you can even change like, you can even specify what is the screen size resolution that you wanna target. So for example, you can target like an iPhone 14, right? and then it will toggle the aspect ratio accordingly. Um, you can even have a Google Nest, which is like tablet mode. 
or iPads is also here. So most of the it covers most of the weird weird aspect ratios, and if it's not covered, you can switch it to responsive and toggle it yourself. Yeah. So if you look at like Google's website, right, um, you can notice how like the information scales really nicely and it's really responsive, uh, depending on the screen size. So this is um intentionally coded this way. If you make a website by yourself, this behavior will not be there by default. So this is why you need this type of um tools to uh like specify at which a uh, point and at which ratio does does it change the CSS rules? So if you notice, I can slowly decrease it, and then at some point, this entire right side bar will disappear. Yeah, so somewhere around one thousand two hundred pixels in width. So when you close your tab, you'll go back to your original aspect ratio. Yeah, so. If you continue scrolling this uh, page, you will notice some other useful features. Like, um, I think below it will say uh, scrolling to view. Uh, where, let's say you... Let me toggle this back. Let's say you want to see this line. You can click. Uh, what is it? Yeah, like this, and then you'll scroll. To the element directly. Um, another thing that not many people know of is you can just drag and drop the element, and this will change the order. So, like if you notice next steps, right? Originally was up here, and then you can just reorder elements really fast, as compared to like changing the lines in the source code in your IDE. So this is what I mean by it's really easy to edit how it looks visually. Uh, the only downside is you can't really save it. Yeah. So moving on to CSS. So CSS is how it looks, right? And I think this is something that most web developers also do not know of. If you... Once again, open the elements tab. Um, if you have your screen looking exactly like how mine is now, you can't really see um, the bottom here, which is styles. So this is why I prefer to have it as a new window. Then you can resize it really easily to focus on this right-hand side here. So this is what um, this shows you in further detail what CSS rules are being applied to the elements, right? So if you right click this, you can see like in the styles here, this Aloha class, right? You can see that this are the styles that are applied. And if you notice, there's this checkbox when you hover over the lines, right? So if you click, it will toggle the CSS rules directly. And this is like super useful to quickly change the look of the page compared to changing something in the IDE, recompiling, or even with hot reload, you have to refresh the page and everything. So this is much, much faster. You change, determine what CSS rules you want, then you can write it in your IDE and uh, make the change permanent. So on top of that, on top of just like clicking rules, right? You can also edit it, right? You can make the line thicker and you'll see the change reflected directly. Or for colors, something I like about, so for colors, you can 
change this hex code, right? And you see the color change. But I think one thing that's quite useful is you can click on the colored square and you can change it to any color in this color palette here. Or if you go outside of go outside of this uh, DevTools page, you can select a color on the page and have it toggle directly. So let's say I want the um the yellow in Chrome and it'll be toggled directly. So you guys can fill in the exercises if you want to. I'm pretty sure these do nothing when you fill them in. <laughs> yeah, but so on top of the really nice color tool, there's also these two buttons here, the element state and the class. So the class here is for you to add a class really quickly. And this will, let's say I call this class, um, test, right? And this class that you create will be added to whichever element you were um, focused on. And then you can, you can continue adding classes. And let's see, you can also, sorry, add new styling rules. So let's say um, I do something like font size large. And this was on oh, one click. Yep, so notice how it changes. So now this is small, right? Then I can change it to large or extra large and it'll be reflected in the DOM directly. So, oh yes. Um, so another thing that is useful, especially when you are coding things like buttons, right, is you have to control the element state. All right, let's say you want, or in this case, you want this thing to turn blue when you're hovering over it. But it's pretty tedious and troublesome, right, to have to hover over it and then like edit something, hover over it to check again. Yeah but you can just toggle the state directly. So again, in your styles tab, right? You can click this hover, you can toggle element state, and then you can just select hover, and then it's permanently um, fixed as, as if there's a mouse hovering over it, right? And there are several other states that you can toggle as well. And yeah, you can just play around with this when you are, writing your CSS um, code. And it's much easier to develop when you can just permanently fix a button state. So if you notice, like let's say it's hovered, right? Then I can like change the color to anything I want. Yeah. So, I right. now it's permanently hovered. I can go and change it and view the changes directly. Oh, it's here. And click it, and it won't be there. 
So another thing that is really cool about this tab, right, is if you're scrolling, if you're scrolling through, right, you'll notice how there's these rules that are like striked out. And what this really means is this rule that is striked out is not applicable to whatever you're seeing now. Right? It might kick in once like a page is um in a in a different state or you are viewing a different thing. Like for instance, this is only applicable when the minimum width is above 600, right? But then this style here is getting overwritten by the one above when the minimum width is above 840, right? Like my current width now is like, I'm pretty sure it's um 1920 or standard HD, right? So it fulfills the minimum width 840 and this takes precedence over the one below. And this is very useful when, especially in this case, right? When you are having different rules for different situations, um, like imagine you didn't uh, order your rules properly and this 600 width rule is taking precedence over the 840, which essentially means this is never used. And through this interface, you would be able to tell when something is wrong. When let's say this is strike through instead of this, then something is clearly wrong, wrong with your rules. Um, so you notice like if I click these, nothing really changes on a page. But if I click this, then suddenly this rule takes precedence. Um, although I don't think there are any visible changes. Yeah, so this is, oh, there's one more thing. So we've covered the styles tab. Something that is also pretty useful is the computer tab. So if you guys have like developed any like websites before, um, one thing you guys might have played around with is things like padding and margins, right? Trying to center an element, trying to place it um, really nicely or trying to align um, some text. And when you're dealing with a lot of white space, it's really hard to tell when um which white space is being added by which rule right because everything is white you can't tell um but with dev tools you can see very clearly like hey if you hover over margin you can you can see this um you hover over margin you can see this orange thing at the top of change my margin right this is what is specified. So even within the dev tools, you can see that there's a number 12 at the top, which means like 12 pixels from the top, there's a margin there. And then there's a border, which is one pixel all around and a padding around the text, which is 16 pixels all around, all right? And if you wanna change that, you can directly change it here as well. You double click it and then you specify like 120 and then you'll shift it like all the way down. And you see this thing here or you can remove it entirely. Oh. And now there's no margin. So this also helps um, with, again, really quickly changing the layout of your page and seeing which rules that you have written are applicable to the element that you are editing. So, so far, has I like lost anyone or everyone okay with the content? Okay, so the next tab that I want to focus on is the console. So the console, well, this is really a tab that is quite useful for when stuff goes wrong, right? This is where all your errors relating to like JavaScript will appear, right? When you open a page, um, it's pretty normal, even for like other company pages to see a lot of red errors and it might be scary, um, but 
usually if the website is working fine, you can pretty safely ignore a lot of these. When you're developing your own application, then that's where you know you need to, hey, what is going on with all this red text? Um, this happened because something, some JavaScript has not like executed correctly or returned an error. Um, for instance, you're trying to fetch a resource from a server, right? And let's say the server is blocking you. Then you'll see that, hey, something is not right. And then you'll, this error will appear in the console. Now, what's the difference between this console and um, whatever you are executing your ID, for example? So this console focuses on the client side JavaScript um, errors or whatever, whatever JavaScript is being executed on the browser. When you code like a modern web application, say in like Next.js, right? A lot of times, not only are you writing code for the browser, whatever is executed on the user's computer, but you are also specifying JavaScript that's executed on the server, right? So when you run a application, like a Next.js application, and then you press like, like npm run dev, and then you see all that error logs or anything. Those usually only apply for server code because your computer is acting as a server and your ID is the one running the server. So in that terminal, you'll see all the um, server logs. But if you try to write like console.log uh, on like a, the client side, you won't, you won't see this console log appearing. You won't see this log appearing in the server code, in the server terminal. You'll see it appear in the browser. And as with like any logs, it's also pretty useful for debugging and seeing what's happening. And yeah, so use cases include like live testing, debugging, handling errors. And yeah, I think it might be more useful for me to demo it. So if you click the link, it will bring you to this um, DevTools page. And you can open the console with your Control Shift J. And here it's pretty empty now. Um, you can type in any valid JavaScript and you'll run it. So things like, let's say, one plus one. So now you have a very portable calculator on any page. Um, or you can do like, let's say you do console.log like test and it will just print test inside this page. Um, you can even also set like variables and it will save it. And if you press your up arrow, right, it will cycle through all your previous commands as well. If you type something similar to uh, like any of the uh, JavaScript, like default or library functions, it will show it here. Or it will also show things that you have written in the past. So like this, I can tap to opt to complete and I can run it again. So these buttons here, let's say I'm doing a log info, right? I click it and it'll print here. So in this case, maybe it's more user-friendly for me to dock it to the site. Then you can see when I click this log info, right? This counter here goes up. So it tries to like shrink all the repeated outputs into one line so your console don't get, doesn't get spammed. If I change the button, let's say I lock warning, right? Then a yellow text will appear because it's a warning. Error will be red. And table, you can even format tables really nicely. Yep, so you can play around with like all of these. Oh yeah, you, if you click these two, like you will like pause for a while because it's an error. Yep, 404, there's a, you made a request. So this get request to this page, which doesn't exist. And it'll tell you 404 not found. So on top of like, um, let's see. Ah, so in the console, you can see like your message is on your left, right? So wherever you wrote, let's say in your 
hello console. This is the message I specified, right? For your errors, these are your error messages. It's on the left. On the right, this is actually the file or the line or command, the code that caused this log. So if you click it, it will bring you to the sources we'll be going through later. And I click, this is log.js file, line 56. It will bring me directly to it, highlighted. And this was the thing that caused the error. So you can see this error here. Yep. So you can, I mean, there's a bunch of things at the top. You can do like filters or you can create live expressions. So these are useful for tracking a variable. Um, say, let's say I want to track A. So A is one, right? And in the console, I change this value of A and you can see it change at the top as well. So when, now it uh, seems pretty useless because I'm, I'm the one setting it. But if let's say the page is running some script at the back and you want to monitor the value of an element, say this, because you can do things like um, document query, uh, well, how do you select a yeah, document? Let's say you want to do this. So now this document not query selector, if you don't know JavaScript might be a bit confusing, but this code is actually refers to this button here. Right, this violation button, you can see it highlighted when I select it. So if I put this into the live expressions, you can see that what is um, selecting. And let's say I try to modify this. Um, you can't see it because text content. Yeah, so I'm looking at the button name now, right? So now it's ADF and I can change it to change it back to false violation. And in the console, it will be reflected here as well. So let's say you have a countdown timer. Um, Let's go to like time.is. Like this clock, right? Yeah, so if you go to your console, you see a bunch of red. Um, don't really need to care about all this. But where's your big clock? Actually, why is it not moving? Ah, moving now. So this digit, right? Um, how do I select this? This is digit six. The ID. Six. Yep. If it should back again, but if I refresh it. Yep, so you can see how this like live expression changes when some JavaScript or something is changing the content. So let's say this clock was hidden, right? But something is still changing. You can monitor it through live expressions. Yeah, so that pretty much sums up the console. Um, it's basically a 
very easy way for you to test JavaScript, execute it, and also see some changes on the page itself. Oh, and one thing to know about the console is this console is not just like a plain um, like JavaScript interpreter, right? One thing to note is it has access to the window. This is why I can do things like document.querySelector because so document refers to the DOM. So I'm querying uh, the element which has the ID of violation, which in this case is this button here. So the only reason why I'm able to do that is because this console here has access to everything that you are seeing. It has access to the window, All right? So I can hit control L and you'll clear everything. So if I do something like window, you can see a bunch of, um, this is a, the window object that's referring to this page, right? And if I do something like window.location.href, you can see the current site that I'm on. So since this console has access to the window, if I set the location to say HTTP google.com, right? This console will change this, this window. So when I press enter, you can see my page reload and change to Google. So this is what it means by like having access to the window. It's not tagged to the website. It's tagged to the, like a tab, the tab itself. So whatever happens in the tab is being tracked here. So yeah, so that's it for console.log. Now, for this slide, this is referring to the sources tab. And I'll briefly run through what it does and do a quick demo. And then we can break after that. So basically the sources tab, um, I went through it just now. It shows you everything that the website has put all the information, all the scripts, the HTML, images, all the resources. And I think it might be better for me to show it. So let's say go back to this page. We saw this um, tab briefly just now, right? So these are all your the scripts. So log.html is similar to what is shown in here. And this is this was the request result that was made when I visited devtools uh, dot, uh, log, not his, uh, devtools me slash console um, slash log.html. This was the original result. And then uh, within the HTML, there was a specified script and it gave, gave us that too. And then um, it rendered. Now, any other changes that happen on the HTML on the DOM, will not be shown in this page anymore. So this is the reason why there's a difference between HTML and the DOM. Now, the useful thing about this sources tab, right? It, it contains, is that it contains a debugger. So for instance, in log.js, right? Let's say I want to, um, I can click this line number here. It highlights it. And what this means is, Whenever this line is going to execute, it is going to pause right before its execution. And why this is useful is because you can then analyze the state of the application, what the values of the different variables are, um, the, and um, this is useful for tracing code. Instead of manually doing it, you can pause the execution at a certain stage, look at what has been done, continue and slowly step through um, the application. So this code will only run when I click the uh, log info button, right? So you'll notice when I click it, it'll pause. And you can see this um, small little like notification here and says pause in debugger. So if you guys are not familiar with debuggers, it's fine. Um, essentially the features are this, um, five buttons here. The, 
play looking button is resume. So when you click it, it resumes the execution. That means it just continues on until the next breakpoint. So in this case, since I only have one breakpoint, when I click resume, it's just going to do nothing. And you'll see there's a printed value, right? If I click log in full again, the console, it won't print because it's stuck here right before the print. And then, um, so this play button resumes. This skip is step over. Step over means you basically go to the next line, right? And since it has now executed this line, you can see it shows in the console. And now this is this third line is just the return of the function call. So if I step over one more time, yeah, you, hmm. or you go back to like whichever call this function. So you can continue stepping, and then it will basically go through the entire thing. And if you don't really care about this, you can just resume and you're back. So the next thing is step into. Step into basically goes further into the function call. Um, in this case, um, it's just console.log. So you can't really step into console.log any further. Um, but if let's say you are calling like some function that calls another function, step into will basically go into the deeper function instead of just going to the next line. And then step out will exit that function. It will resume until that function exits. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the debugger. Another thing that is useful is this call stack. So the call stack shows you um, which function, which function, the function call stack, uh, the sequence that has been called before it has reached uh, that line that you specified. So there'll be exercise later that this call stack will be really useful. Um, yeah, so this is it for debugging. You guys can continue playing around with it. It's, honestly, I think, I feel that debugging is the most useful feature of test tools, personally, for like, the type of work that I do. Yeah. So, yeah. If you guys want, uh, we can take a break now and you guys can take your own time to play around with the simple password checker and other password checker. Yeah, so these sites, that's a brief like, uh, walk through. There's this password um, text box here, and the goal is to basically try to guess like what the password is. Now, for the simple one, you can do it without the debugger, but I urge you to try using the features to step through the JavaScript code. Or if you find this challenge too simple, um, you can try the harder one. So the harder one is much harder and I think it takes quite some time. I'll demo the solution later. Don't worry if like you can't complete it. Yep. Yep. So we can take a break now. Okay. So I guess had enjoyed the food and had some time to try the challenges. So now I'll be demoing like the solutions to it. So for the simple password checker exercise, if you scroll all the way down, um, there's this password text box that you need to fill in, right? Um, you can do this without the debugger. And essentially, you open the DevTools. And this page like heavily hints the solution, which is now there's this JavaScript code to handle password, right? You expand the script and even tells you to like, focus on this check password function. And if you quickly read the code, you will notice that hey, it's just checking the password first five letters. This um, spells out a certain word. You enter it. And 
you're able to get the answer. Now, if you want to do it um, slightly more, um, it's not more properly, I guess any way that works will work, right? But let's say you, you click on this button, or rather, let's say you don't even know that what this button is doing. What you can actually do is you can set a breakpoint on the button click itself. So you can look at event listener, right? And if you look at a mouse, you can expand mouse, and then you can click, you can check this click um, checkbox. And now what this does is every time I click the mouse, it triggers a breakpoint, right? Because it detected that I click the mouse. Now, if I click resume or like I step through, that's not pretty much, um, that doesn't really do anything. But let's say I click this submit button. Now, if I step through, right, you notice that, hey, it brings me to this element which I clicked on, right? It triggered the check password function. So with this, I can really quickly identify um, what function is triggering and um, yeah, what, yeah, what code is being executed when I click the button. And I can continue to step through it. Um, in this case, I should step into because I want to see the result of the details of the check password function. And you'll bring me directly here. Now I can go through each um, check to see what is being returned. Now, another useful thing is I can click these three buttons and I can see the uh, show console drawer. Now this is, is actually the same console as this tab, right? But it's right next to your debugger so that it's really convenient. Now I want to see whether password zero is equals to I, right? I can check it before it's even being executed is true. In fact, I can see the whole value of password itself. So this is useful for when hey, you don't even know what variable is being checked because sometimes code might be really obfuscated um, when it's minified. Uh, then it's really hard to tell what is what variable values are. So in this case, it's pretty straightforward to just step through and then to figure out that, hey, you need to spell out uh, idiot before you, there's a password. Now for the other challenge, which I think I saw some of you attempting, um, actually it's pretty hard. Uh, I'm not sure if it's even solvable. Okay, it's solvable within 15 minutes, but you have to be really skilled to do it. So for me, I'll open the sources, right? And I immediately noticed that, hey, there's this JavaScript file here. And it's pretty obvious that this function is what we should be targeting. So how you could use the debugger to do this is, I'll start at the breakpoint here. I'll type in some text. I click check flag and I trigger the debugger already. So I can step through it. And I essentially slowly look at the functions and the conditions that are being triggered. I notice that, hey, if any, if this um, condition is true, then there's this wrong flag that is going to toggle, right? And check flag will return false. And you notice that this pattern is common at many places, right? So you can immediately tell that, hey, you are not supposed to trigger any of these conditions if you want to reach the end. In this case, correct flag. So then it's basically a case of trying to create a flag that suits all these conditions. So the first condition is the flag length and it shouldn't equal to this thing here. Now a very useful thing about having a console here is I can copy this, I can paste it here, and hey, this is 52. So I know my flag length 
uh, if my flag length is not 52, it's going to be wrong. All right? So I can actually just set my flag to 52 characters. All right? So five. And do you want 52? All right? And now if I step through it, this will not trigger anymore. Oh wait, it did still did. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, you can resume and then you modify this input. And now passes. So now it checks the character at zero. So if you don't know what it means, you can run it. And let's say you change this to like ABC all the way, you notice that, hey, this is the first character. This first character shouldn't equal to this expression here. So this expression here, let me just copy the whole thing. This expression here goes to F. And then the next condition is this. And in the interest of time, if you slowly evaluate everything, it will be black, this, the first five characters. So zero, one, two, three, four, right? And the last character, 51, would be a closing bracket. So now you know that your flag should be, uh, so these are your 51 char uh, 52 characters. You know, our first five should be this, and your last one should be this, right? So you can continue from here. And now you will pass the first condition and the second condition. But you fail at the third one. So instead of like pausing at the top all the time, you can delete this. And now pause here, you skip the first two. Now this third condition checks that, hey, if I do this black, character code at the fifth, the sixth character to string two, and don't really know what this means, right? You can evaluate it again. Um, looks like it's converting it to binary, right? 97, when you convert it to binaries, um, on one zero 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 one. So you can basically go backwards. Um, if you do like a, or you can even do like the reverse, right? Uh, never mind. I'm just going to use a web tool, binary to S key. All right. You copy this and you convert into seven, seven, H and the last one. Is a tree. So now you know your three characters, seven H tree. Right. So and change your input. And now you should pass this check. Now this if this requires a little bit of math knowledge. So this arrow is the XOR. So what it's doing is it's taking the next character, um, XORing it with direct 2F, and then comparing it to this number. So if I do the reverse, it will be direct 70, XOR, direct 2F, and I need a character that corresponds to the S key number 95. And I'm pretty sure I can do a string from character code 95 and it's an underscore. So now I know this is the underscore. And I think you'll notice that, hey, this, this pattern here, uh, 
Is it this? This pattern here repeats quite a few times. So you know that all these are underscores, right? And okay, before that, we have this condition to deal with. So, you can so it converts ASCII to hex. So now we just convert hex to ASCII. And developer tools. So this is from a substring 9 to 24. Think so. Yeah. So this is the current flag I found so far. Then skip this condition, skip this condition, skip this condition. Okay, we are back at this underscore. So we can quickly replace that. Then we're left with okay, this tree. So again, we can do a uh, string dot character from from character code sixty four at one two two. Doesn't look right. Oh, eight. Ah, so eight is octo. So we need to change it. So you can you can either do a octo to ASCII. Or these three numbers, or for octo, you can do you add a zero in front. And it will work. So for our three will be the next three characters. And another followed by another underscore. And now another ASCII to hex, except this time is reversed, right? So we can just take this, can do our previous hex to ASCII. Go back here and or reverse on it. How do you do it? Ah, we just copy this. So we can double check by running it through and we should pass this, 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 this as well. Done this, another underscore. And for this, we see that you convert the next five characters or four characters, and it should be mod 191 and 7, right? So this basically means you, like 191 and 7 are the prime factors to the number produced by this. So if we do 7 times 191, get 1337. So flag dot substring 41, 45 should basically be 137. You can't set it like that because 
um, strings are immutable in JavaScript. So you have to just copy paste it and say it again. Now it's followed by another underscore. And lastly is this. So it converts something to hex and then converts it to A64. So you can reverse it by going A to B. And this is now in hex. You put it back into here. And then you do the reverse. What's the reverse? Else tools. So now your final flag should be this. Now if you check it and you resume, yeah, should light up green. Now this demo was probably pretty fast and hard to follow, but um I think the more important thing is the workflow that um I demonstrated. Essentially, you look at the condition and slowly break down the code, right? It's really hard to, you know, if you are tracing it statically without debugger, it's really hard to piece together the parts of the flag. But when you're doing it um, with the debugger, you can use the console to evaluate parts of the condition and slowly figure out what type of, um, what are the constraints to the program you are running. And this way, it's much easier to figure out uh, what the code is trying to do. Yeah, so moving on, uh, we have the network tab. So the network tab will be the last um, panel that we are going to be exploring today. And what it does is basically track all the network activity that is being performed right now. Just now in the, uh, when I was explaining the console, I also mentioned that the field requests will appear in the console as like um, errors, right? So actually, what's the difference between the console and this network request tab? Now, the difference is the network tab is way more in-depth, right? It not only shows you um, things that failed, it also shows you things that succeeded. And this is pretty important because um, it, it, it is useful for seeing what is happening by an application, right? Uh, when you are creating a website, you will be able to see through the network tab, which requests are taking like the longest, right? If you have a server that is taking forever to respond uh, for that image, right? Everything else is fine. Just that one image is responding really slowly. You'll be able to identify that through the network tab because it shows you the, how long each request is, is taking. It gives you that type of detail where what parameters are being specified with the request, the result, the size of the result, and um, what server you are pointing to, which URL, uh, whatever cookies are sending all the data. And this is pretty useful um, for monitoring the network traffic that happens uh, whenever you visit a site or change pages, right? Um, in terms of like web developer perspective, it's very useful for identifying bottlenecks in your page loads. And why is this important, right? Because your page loads are, well, when you get into like more advanced web development topics, you realize that your page loads are pretty important for your Google search rankings, right? If you have a very slow page load, Google will like nerf your um, SEO score. And you know, API requests, you can see which APIs are being used and see which resources are, you know, not coming in uh, properly. Now, so the uh, exercise for this is actually to go and visit NUS mods and go and look at some of the requests is being made. And I actually did it myself yesterday and I noticed a few interesting things. 
And I actually confirmed um, these answers with uh, a friend I know who maintains NUS mod. So it's actually pretty interesting to figure out what are the uh, some of the reasons why these requests are being made. So actually, I'm just going to demo it in front. So if you visit NUS mods, right? Once again, you open up your dev tools and you go to the network. So you notice there's this recording network activity you have to reload first. So when you first open um, your network tab, it won't show anything. That doesn't mean there's anything there. It just hasn't started recording. It only starts recording when you first click on it. So if you reload the page, you notice all these files that are being pulled. So this um, icon at the side is a very visual indicator of what type of file is it. So this blue color thing, it's a document. And usually this is referring to, so you can double click it. The headers is what is being sent. If you're familiar with like um, HTTP, um, if you're not, don't really need to care about this. Um, usually the response is what I kind of look at. But yes, so this is your HTML document. It's this blue icon is sort of used to indicate any documents like HTML that's being sent. Now these brackets, these are your JSON files. Right? It's a very commonly used like file type. They get its own a icon. Now these you can have already it's a script dot js files. And then your CSS files will have a very nice paint brush. Yep. And your icons will have the icon itself. So you can look through it. And yeah, you can see the different uh files that are being requested when you load the page. So if you You click away and you go back and you navigate the pages, right? It will just continue. You won't need to like keep on refreshing. Yeah. So you'll notice that the field requests have this um X on them. I mean it's like it failed to fetch. And yeah, it'll just tell you it failed to respond. There's no resource found with this identifier. Now you can go back to the headers and then see what you actually sent. Right, so respond the request headers. You can see it's a get request that you sent. Um, at this path to this host, and these are all the different things that you specified. And based on these parameters, you couldn't get anything. Yeah. So this was actually pretty useful, even when I was uh making the slides for this, um, the content for this workshop. I was having some trouble deploying the this website. And I realized, oh, it's because I made a typo. I, I specified like slides instead of workshop. And I specified workshop in one place, slides in one place. And because it wasn't syncing up, it wasn't rendering properly. And I identified this because in the network step, it was making a request to slides when I was on um, workshop. So uh, because of this desync, um, the page wasn't loading. And by looking at a network request, I was able to see that, and then I changed it, and um, the bug was fixed. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you look at. Yeah. Back to the questions. If you look at venue information, you'll notice that hey, look, the authority is different from. The other. Like, um, sorry. Now you look at uh your SAM one, right? Hey, this is to NUS mods. The URL says NUS mods, but this uh this is NUS mods, but your venues says API dot NUS mods. So you're like, hey, actually, NUS mods is not just that one domain, right? There's another service, their own API service, and 
which was it? I saw it just now. Um, there was another analytics, I think. I lost it. Can I search for it? Right. Um, yeah, but I think if you look through closely, oh yeah, so it's querying your government data sets as well. Then there's this sentry IO thing. And yeah, honestly, this wasn't working for me yesterday. Yeah. So um yeah, I'm not sure why it's working now. Maybe they fixed it. But yesterday this was like not working. And I asked my friend and he was like, oh yeah, we kind of deprecated it. I guess they got it back. Um, so actually, the last question, I think it's the hardest one. Are you able to find the function that makes this request? And you can do that pretty easily using this, uh, network request, because you can see the initiator is this column here. If you click on it. You jump directly to the line that called it. And in this case, it's by some other site. Um, and you can even, if you want to go further, you set a breakpoint there. So where was it? So this, right? You set a breakpoint to this line. And now when you refresh the page, and it tries to make a request to um sentry. Hey, this is going somewhere else. Yeah, then you break point here. Then you can use this and you get now this is where the cost that comes in handy, right? Now you can see all the various functions that yeah, it's called to get to this place. And this is the topmost one. And you can see that thing that's being called is this huge s function that's just one. So yeah, I think I guess like in your free time if you want to go and explore all the different like APIs that NUS mods um queries. Uh you can go and look into it. I think it's pretty interesting to understand like all the work that goes into developing um this open source project that all students in NUS use for their module planning. Yeah, and with that, we've come to the end of the workshop. Uh does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Yeah, so we appreciate it if you guys like can give us some feedback on uh where the workshop, where it's good, where it's bad, um, things that we can improve on. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you some time to scan the QR code. Yep, and what's next? So, yep, so if you want to learn more about the workshops and the events we hold, you can scan this QR code which links to our channels. 
And yeah, the next workshop we have is actually on this Thursday. It's by our sponsor, Marshall Ways, and it will be on cybersecurity. So you can register for this workshop through our Telegram channels. There's a message that um, has a sign up form there. And it will be happening at the same place here um, in two days. And on Friday, we have a Friday Hacks talk on exploring AI research from a, I think it's a PhD student. And also a scaling with Ruby on Rails. I think that is by a startup founder, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And yeah, feedback form, if you guys haven't scanned it. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope to see you guys at more of our events.